what does insight-driven messaging look like for sales? Like a whole lot more deals, fast. Jump on high-intent leads in the moment with Intercom, the business messenger that extends the reach of your team 24-7. Intercom creates more opportunities for you by booking meetings and collecting data from leads automatically. Take Intercom user Elegant Themes. They now convert 25% of leads through Intercom's messenger. Deals don't wait. Get them with Intercom. Go to intercom.com slash deals. That's intercom.com slash deals. Hey, it's that time again. Time to grab your board. Jump in the wake. Swim out and see if you can catch a wave that's uh, starting to catch up there as the sales pipeline starts to curl before your very eyes with the man who makes it curl each and every week. makes my toes curl each and every week. Matt Hines. Well, let's hope that that sales pipeline is cresting (laughs) right now as we finish. It's the last month, the last quarter, it's the end of the year. If you're on a calendar fiscal year, this is it. This is it. Um, This is it. And and it's also the reason why a lot of companies have made their fiscal years now February through January. If you're in sales, right, like you're trying to close out the year in the last two weeks of the month, basically everyone's like, nah. It's Christmas. Come on. It's a holiday. You know, it's funny. We just had somebody on uh, uh, from uh, Goldmine CRM, and he was calling in. He's on a plane trying to make that last push right before the right before the close of business uh, this week here. And I thought, you know, what a horrible thing to be trying to do to get anybody to pay attention to you, much less buy anything from you the last two weeks of December. Well, I mean, those are two different things, though, right? I mean, there's getting someone to close, and then there's getting someone to pay attention. And I could argue that if you have something compelling, people might be more likely to give you some attention now. Mm. If you're trying to get a complex deal through right now that isn't already basically in the bag or committed, it can be difficult because you have a lot more members of the buying committee that are now potentially out of the office. and They're distracted. Know, I mean, They're somewhere else. They're thinking of something else. The, the holiday party's tomorrow here. Yeah, Yeah. no, it's it's done. I mean, in honest, a, a little bit of an advantage for people this year is that Christmas and Hanukkah actually line up quite nicely. They're the same week. Uh, that doesn't always happen, but we have <laughs> right. that this year at least. That said, especially you know office settings, you have people that are taking some time off, but also working. And for the time that they are working, if they're working between Christmas and New Year's, or you know, especially when you've got a weird year like this year, when you've got Christmas and New Year's in the middle of the week. Yeah. So are you taking the beginning or end of the week off? Are you working those days? If you're working those days, your calendar is probably lighter. So are you more likely to respond to an email? Are you more likely to actually ah, attend that I webinar? See. Are you more likely to read a little more of that blog post? My experience says yes. Where a lot of marketers will say, well, let's avoid the end of the year. Honestly, it, we're doing our last newsletter of the year. We'll go out on New Year's Eve. We always do the last Tuesday of the month. Every year there's a discussion of, oh, should we do it early? Different. It's always the best read newsletter of the year. Really? So does it start off, it was a night before Christmas and all through the uh, funnel, not a... Not a uh... <laughs> Something was, I don't know, I can't think of anything that rhymes with the funnel here, but uh, not a mouse was stirring, even a... Uh, what rhymes with funnel? funnel. We'll, have to, we'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> That'll be our next challenge for next year. I was going to say, thanks everyone for joining us uh, another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. We went right past the pleasantries of talking about unique sports, college football, the hat that Paul is wearing that I thought said Michigan hockey and actually says Michigan honors. Yes, I was an honors student. I graduated magna cum laude from the University of Michigan. Who'd, who'd know all these many years later? Three years of doing this. I never would have guessed that. <laughs> oh, ouch. Uh, that, was a, that was a bad joke. That came out of but I wanted to thank everyone for joining us on another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. Well, you know, uh, si- since you brought it up, I have to bring up yeah. two sports things. You know, it's kind of the end of the year last thing. I have been waiting a decade now for Michigan, the University of Michigan, to beat our arch rival, Ohio State. We've been waiting a, a decade. A decade. This used to we used to trade every year when I was a kid and when I was in college in the seventies and even in the eighties. Now it's been a decade since we beat our travel. So as we head into the new decade, in two weeks we're gonna not only turn the calendar on another year, we're gonna turn it into another decade. Starts with a new number. Oh, well, if you want to talk about Michigan football, so, I mean, it's one thing to say we got the new decade to try to beat Ohio State, but before we even get there, (laughs) you have to face a pummeling from Alabama who is pissed that they're not in the playoffs right now. Um, I'm looking forward to that game. I mean, Michigan is a good football team. Alabama is obviously a good football team. Should be entertaining. I'm hoping it is not one-sided. Fun to watch. It's generally been in those bowl games when uh, U of M gets involved. I don't understand. And I was reading an article that said Michigan doesn't have, really, probably doesn't have a hope of ever catching 
Ohio State or the other programs because it's a more elite academic school and it is therefore harder to recruit and get these college athletes to go through. I don't want to go to Harvard. I want to go to the big school that gets me the big bucks when I graduate one. And I sure don't want to be doing anything other than football when I'm there. It's it's interesting. I think that there are certainly schools that have more stringent academic requirements, even of student athletes than others. I don't see a school like Michigan or Ohio State losing prestige as both a great academic school as well as a great football school anytime soon. But, you know, dynasties come and go. I mean, I could argue that we're going to see a little bit of an unraveling of Alabama over the next couple of years. We say it's not going to last there forever. So we'll see what happens. I would argue that although Ohio State has had a really strong season this year, that is because of Urban Meyer's setup and his recruiting. And so there's always a little bit of a halo effect when you've got someone that takes over for a great right. program like that. And we'll see if they can continue that. See if they can continue it. Well, then the other one, since you want to jump out of college into I'm the cursed football fan from uh, you know U of M. Think about where else I uh, my allegiance lies. I was born in the state of Minnesota, so I feel like for some crazy reason, I God gave me the Minnesota Vikings as my professional football team. <laughs> you know, the one of two teams that has only been to the Super Bowl there four times, and the only other one I could claim to would be Detroit, where I spent most of my youth uh, after we moved from Minnesota. And they're one of two or three teams never even been to the Super Bowl here. So you know, what have I got to look forward? to is i'm getting older on here man i only got how many more decades left here i gotta i gotta win one of these programs here i gotta i gotta notch one on my belt here yeah, I was with you until about four years ago when my Cubbies won the World Series. So, <laughs> yeah. If I don't see another one the rest of my lifetime, I'll be upset. But at least I got to see one. At least I got to see one. That's the way I feel. You know, that's my bucket list. People say, what's your bucket list? I'd love to see one of my teams I've been rooting for <laughs> since a kid win the Super Bowl. Honest to God. Well, anyway. Well, it's a legitimate question that came up in one of my favorite college football podcasts. And apparently we're not going to talk about this. <laughs> well, we will. We'll get into it. Yeah. Not to worry about it. So, so uh, the question came up said, okay, there are blue blood college football programs. Right. At this point, appear to be like every year, right? You've got the Clemson, you've got the Ohio State, you've got the Oklahoma. Alabama is still in that in that conversation, right? If the chance of winning a championship are limited to a single digit number of teams, what are the rest of the teams playing for? And and someone had made the <laughs> yeah. argument on the podcast that if you are not a blue blood team then you shouldn't even be thinking about the national championship. Does that mean that you're basically not rooting for your team to win? Mm. Well, I'll tell you, uh, as a longtime Michigan fan, spent many years living there and then went to the college there. I was always amazed that we rarely rooted for the national championship. That was not what determined whether the program was a success, whether people turned out, whether the coach got rehired. It really was if you beat your rivals in the Big Ten, if you beat particularly Ohio State. And so there were games where they actually went for they could have gone for the win or, or they could have done something dramatic to try and go for a national championship. But let's just beat Ohio State. Let's just hold on and beat Ohio State here today. Uh, and, and I think that mentality has shifted. I don't think it's that regional or small time, but maybe it is in many of these other conferences. Maybe you just want to beat your crosstown rival. Well, I, I look at, you know, historically for, you know, my, my University of Washington Huskies. I mean, you want to winning the conference was a big deal. Beating the Washington State Cougars was at least as big of a big deal. And winning the conference was important, but mainly because you want to go to the Rose Bowl. The goal every year wasn't to, for some uh, college football playoff, which didn't exist. It was and quite frankly, still is get the Rose Bowl. So you can go down in the warm weather and celebrate and party. That was the same with us. We just wanted to get the heck out of frozen Michigan here. So everybody (laughs) wanted to win the go to the Rose Bowl here. But now that even that's gotten complicated. Now you don't you win the conference and you got to go. You might go to a national championship uh, playoff instead of going to the Rose Bowl. That's very confusing to me. And I found out this morning what used to be called the Bahama Bowl. The Bahama Bowl. <laughs> well, it's good. It's, it's in the Bahamas, which makes sense, right? Okay. So it's, I think it's played Friday night or something. This coming Friday night, tomorrow night. What used to be called the Bahamas Bowl is now the the Makers Only Bowl. Mm. And so I had to look this up. Like Makers Only, what is that? And I assume. And first thought, like that, you know, you confuse it with Makers Mark. It's not a bourbon. That's what I thought. Makers, yeah. Makers Only is the slogan for a business park outside of O'Hare Airport in Chicago. <laughs> And they sponsor a bowl to, they to sponsor spread. the Bahamas. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. I know. Well, I think Matt Hines Marketing should be sponsoring a bull. That's what I'm looking for. I mean, the if Heinz we're. Heinz Bowl? Should we, we should yeah. start a Heinz Bowl? Yeah. It's going to be played here in Redmond, Washington, in the, uh, in the high school football stadium. Well, let's circle back because you did have an interesting topic. And this is usually <laughs> the. I t- as usual, I took you far afield here. I found it, you know, uh, interesting. Every time this year, People want to do the end of the year wrap up. What happened last year? What to do this year? You had a different take, and give me your title. You because you're not saying here's three things to do and four things we learned this past year. You're kind of giving us a cautionary tale. What what was your title for today? Well, I, what I was thinking on this one, uh, in, in you know, in addition to making fun of college bowl games, <laughs> is, is, um, you know, how to start 2020 the wrong way. We have a lot of these like year in review, doing recaps of things, right? And then like we all feel good about ourselves, and then we say, oh, you know, what am I going to do for next year? What are my resolutions? Well, sometimes I learn as much from the worst practices as the best practices, mm. and to know what are the yellow flags and red flags I should be looking for, and what are the things that I maybe have or haven't done in the past that more consistently lead to bad performance. I thought that might be more interesting to cover because we're always trying to come. It's a new year, new day, turn the page. Everything is, starts new again. Maybe not. Maybe we've got some old practices here. Maybe we've got some ingrained things that are just like the University of Michigan football team, that there must be something more ingrained in it the 10 years they can't win here. Well, I could argue. I mean, look, it's only two weeks until the end of the year anyway. Right. right. But if you're sitting at the end of November and you've got a month left to go and you're creating your 2020 resolutions, if it's a resolution for 2020 that you're not willing to start in December, how important is it really? <laughs> <laughs> you got to wait two more weeks to get the. Well, this is really so important. I, you know, but... I, really, I really want to get in shape. And so I'm going to start working yeah. in January. It's like, what about now? <laughs> yeah. Um, Good point. It's, so, so I, I, I want to fix I want to fix my company. I want to change my life. I want to improve my uh, personal appearance. And by God, give me two more weeks and I'm ready to get started here. Well, so I think that there's four things I've been thinking about. That if you don't have these in place or if you haven't done these, then it's hard to really establish momentum and results early in any period of time, whether you're doing that at the beginning of a new year or whether you're doing that at the beginning of a new quarter or whether you're just doing that on Monday. And I think the first one on my list it's hard to start 2020 successful if you don't have a plan, if you don't know where you're going. It's been a long year. We're all tired. If you've had a great year, you worked hard and you're tired. If you've had a bad year, that's draining and you're tired. And, you know, there's parties, there's eggnog, there's all kinds of good food. Like, it feels good <laughs> and you should feel good taking some time off. But if you wake up on January 2nd, or in this case, maybe you call it January 6th because maybe you take the long weekend right. and you just go back to work and start doing your email again. Just start responding to other people's priorities. That's a recipe for just falling into the same reactive mess that you may be in today. So if you don't go into the holiday period and into January 2nd with a plan, knowing what are your objectives, what are you going to be focused on, what are you trying to achieve, what 12 months from today does success look like? And what are the key things that are going to get you there? Knowing what that plan is, at least going into the storm, knowing the storm is probably going to try to tear it to pieces. But having that plan up front, if you don't have some semblance of that, it's going to be very hard to start the year off on the right track. I'm going to do that next year. That's my resolution. I'm going to get a plan next year. So you're going to take a gap year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to red shirt. I'm going to red shirt my business here. Yeah, we're going to take a year off. Screw it. I'm going to take a play for Look, you know, to be honest, I don't have any problem with that. I mean, like I've got a fr- I've got a friend who has worked her ass off, who's built an amazing business, and she's taking a sabbatical. She's been on a sabbatical for a while, and she's taking time off of work just to kind of reset in a number of ways. And there is nothing wrong with that. If your plan is to take some time off, if your plan is to just go off in the mountains in Nepal and just kind of do your thing and come back and figure it out in March, that's not bad. Like that, no one else can tell you your plan is wrong, but that becomes your plan. If your plan is gap year, then that's your thing. If you say, look, I'm just tired. I just don't want to work anymore. I want it. That's not a plan. (laughs) Then you're going to feel feel guilty for the things you're not doing. Yeah. Well, I'm feeling guilty already that we're not playing a second commercial here. That's what I'm feeling guilty. (laughs) Well, you know, when we start start by making fun of uh, uh, business parks in Chicagoland, uh, time does fly. uh, So, uh, uh, Davey, I'm uh, Davey, who's listening live today. I I apologize. We've gone off the rails, but uh, we're going to take a quick break, pay some bills. We'll come back. We're going to talk more about a couple other things I think are really important ways to start your 2020 off on the right track. This is Sales by Brian Radio. Sales teams, is your website helping you turn prospects into customers? Because Intercom thinks it should be. 
Intercom makes that little chat bubble in the corner of a website. That's their messenger. But it's so much more than that. The Intercom Messenger is designed for businesses to jumpstart on customer intent in the moment. It connects you when you're there or automatically books meetings and captures data leads when you're away. You'll sell more, more efficiently. Like Intercom user Elegant Themes, they added the Intercom Messenger to their site, and now they convert 25% of their leads to paid subscriptions through live chat. Just having the messenger sparked valuable customer conversations that Elegant Themes might not have had otherwise. That's Intercom's whole deal, connecting you to customers while they're on your website with timely, personal insights. Because when customers have a great experience, it's great for business too. Help your website help you land more customers. Then see everything Intercom can do. Go to intercom.com slash deals today. That's intercom.com slash deals. All right. We're going to uh, slash back to the conversation here. You know, I just have to comment that every time I hear that commercial, I love it because I've actually been to Elegant Themes. It's a great place to buy uh, WordPress themes uh, for sites and stuff. And, and so I think it's a great... There's something you can learn from. If you want to put a testimonial for companies that other people actually like and have used, that totally, totally reinforces your message. Hey, they're doing it. I should, too. That's right. I love that spot. So what else can we do to uh, plan, take a year off? I want to relax. I want to enjoy the holidays for once. And you want me to already have a plan in place to hit the ground running January 3rd. Yeah. And these aren't just things that I that are like, here's what Matt thinks. I think that uh, I feel like when I talk to people that feel like they get off the rails into a new year, when they feel like they have to do some kind of a reset, um, you know, sometimes they're like, I wish I would have done X. I wish I would have had Y in place. And so these are four things that I hear. One, you know, the first one we talked about is having a plan. Um, and if you don't have a plan going in, then you don't have confidence in what you're doing. You, you don't have a foundation to focus. You don't have a means of being able to say no to certain things. And I think a function of the plan is knowing your priorities is knowing what is most important to you you just said all spend 24 hours a day doing work doing important work doing things that seem worthwhile and never get everything potentially that we want to get done done so knowing what your priorities are not only helps you focus Bob, but it also helps you know when you can say no and be comfortable saying no that's it that's what i wanted to, i was trying to butt in there is saying no it is so hard to say no let's say you're a business okay any business we're only going to do this we're going to focus on these kinds of accounts we're going to do this we're going to focus in this direction this product whatever and somebody else walks in the door and says hey i got some money here will you do this sure what the heck uh or, or whatever version of that you want to say uh we're not going to spend much time and effort doing this but here we are doing it again. It's that saying no, I think is the hardest thing to learn in business. I, I suffer from it. It's hard to say no to money. It's hard to say no to emergencies. It's hard to say no to time off. It's hard to say no to so many things. It is. And, and I think oftentimes we are afraid of missing out. Yeah. I think oftentimes we say, I think I've heard people say they say no because they aren't confident in what they have said yes to. Mm. They haven't taken the time to commit to what they're saying yes based on their priorities, based on their plan, based on what they're trying to achieve. And therefore, when you don't have those priorities and can't say no to things, then you feel overwhelmed again. Yes. Right. And like, simply if all you did, forget to do lists. And I'm, I'm saying this somewhat facetiously, but I'm trying to make a point. I am a big fan of the Getting Things Done system by David Allen. I've mm -hmm. got my projects. I've got my broader lists. I know the things I want to get done. I do this every day, every day in the morning. I write down what are the two to three things I need to get done that day. And before I write those two to three things down, I write my goals. I write, I literally write down wow. the same goals I wrote down yesterday and the day before and a week ago, because these are these are my 12 month goals. Do you pull out a pen or do you just pop it into a computer? No, this is a handwritten journal that I use. And so I will write down and without getting into it, I have three goals that are 12 month goals and they're numeric goals that are professional and personal goals. And underneath that. And one under of them is to host a bowl for Heinz marking. I know to, that. To, 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 to basically to replace <laughs> the, the Chicago business park. <laughs> yes. As the lead. Lead sponsor for that uh, bowl, absolutely. The Bahama Bowl sponsored by Heinz Marketing. Yes. Uh, so that's that's on the list. Okay. So, so if I've got those three things listed, what are the three things I need to do today that are going to most closely and most efficiently help me get towards that? Those are my yeah. priorities for the day. Not all my email, not everything else that might come at me, 
but those two or three things. I wish I, I wish I could say it did that. I, I think too often I just have a list of to-do, which is the Smokey the Bear school of uh, things. Where's the forest fire sprouting up? And I'm going around stomping out little fires all day long. I want to get to those bigger goals, those longer goals. But, geez, I got immediate needs right now. I got to answer this email. I got to get this out. I got to go buy something. I'm out of ink. I got to go do something today. Yeah, and this isn't an argument against being opportunistic. This isn't this isn't to say that, that you're going to start ignoring all of your emails from now on. But if all you do is put out those fires, like I could argue your inbox is a fire. Your yeah. inbox is everybody else's priorities and other things they want from you. Yeah. And you can make yourself feel really good by having a shorter inbox, by getting everything off your plate, and you could get nothing done. You could make zero progress. And then all of a sudden, it's the end of January, and you've done that for a month, and you're nowhere closer to whatever those goals and priorities are that you've set for yourself. Right, right. right? And this is this is related to, like, if you're trying to hit a sales number, like, you've got a big sales number you hit with these complex deals. That's not a one-day thing, but what can you do today to get closer to those deals, to get yourself closer to your goal? Absolutely. So the number one thing if people aren't successful is when they don't have a plan. Number two is not knowing their priorities, which allows them to say no. Number three is not knowing and setting your limits. Mm. We have limits. We're super people. We're, I'm Superman. I can. There's no limit. Uh, 24 hours a day, I'll make 25. Good for you. I'm not. I'm literally <laughs> sitting in my office right now. We're doing sales platform radio. I've got my adrenaline going, which is good because I have a cold. Like I feel terrible right now. <laughs> right, and so I'm like, oh, it's just I got I got a couple more things got to get done, and then I'm literally thinking about going home and taking yeah, a nap. Right. I gotta get cause, like the new Star Wars movies out tomorrow. We're taking the whole team to see the Rise of Skywalker. Dang. I cannot have a cold tomorrow because no. I need to go watch Star Wars. I agree. So, but I think my point on this is is knowing your limits and knowing what you are willing to do to get to something, knowing how much work are you willing to do to get to something, and when do you want to just go home? When are you going to prioritize other things in your life? My dad was a very successful executive for Chrysler Corporation, rags to riches, started off in the assembly line, became a vice president for Chrysler Corporation back in the days when you could do those kinds of things. And I said to him a couple of times, you know, this smart alecky stuff a kid would say, hey, you were vice president. Why weren't you ever president? Did you ever want to be president of the company? And he looked at me, he says, you'll learn. He said, at some point in your life, when you, when you look ahead at what it takes to go that extra step, and you decide it's either worth it or it's not. The things you're willing to do, what are your limits, your personal limits? And I think that's true of sales staff. I think that's true of employees, everybody. We think we'll just throw some more money at them and that'll push them one step, one step. At some point, they stop. They've reached their limit, their personal limit. If you know what your priorities are, and when I say setting your priorities with the number two on the list, it's not just your professional priorities. It's like, what do you want in your life? Is there any priority? Do you have a priority around health? Do you have a priority around spending time with your kids? Do you have a priority around spending more time at a beach house? Like whatever that is, if those are your priorities, that can be used to help set your limits. Yeah, That can be used right. to help say, I'm only willing to work this much time. Let me give you another example of how this works. I have been bad at doing this in the last couple of years, but for a period of time, I made a deal with my wife and my kids. I said, every Tuesday and Thursday night, when I get home, I am putting my phone and my computer away. Mm. From the time I get home Tuesday and Thursday until the next morning, I am not working. I'm not touching my computer. Do you know how much more productive that made me during the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Knowing, knowing that, that I could not yeah. do email at night, that I couldn't just be like, ah, I'll finish this later. I'll finish this after dinner. Knowing that my limits those days. I put limits on clients. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I tell them there are certain times, do not reach me. I'm not going to respond unless it's the fire absolutely emergency once a year, 100 year earthquake that comes. I don't want to be heard on, for me, it's Sunday afternoons. Uh, Sunday is just not a day. I'm going to respond. And people still try and press it and say, I need this. First thing Monday, I got to do this. I say, you should have told me that Friday. Or tell me that first thing Monday, but you know, and and once I set that, and you and you stick to it, that's the part hard part about sticking to boundaries is it's sticking to them, because everybody wants to. Well, this is an exception. Come on, we 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 need. You can't be this week. You got to do it right now, and I think that you have to find those. And and yet, I like you say, I become more productive and manage the relationships better because I'm not just constantly reacting. Yep. And the last thing on the list, because I know we're running out of time yes. here. Uh, so I've got things that are keeping you from hitting your number, sort of being successful 2020, not having a plan, not knowing uh, your priorities, not knowing and setting your limits. And number four is when you don't prioritize yourself. Because mm. you could set, like you could have priorities and limits and you can have all of those parameters relative to your company, 
relative to your team, relative to your family. But if you don't prioritize yourself, your health, your time, your well-being, you will not be productive and be your best self for those objectives, for those priorities. And that's the key, isn't it? It starts with your personal productivity and your personal habits. I mean, if you if you are sacrificing yourself for others constantly, relative to your time, relative to your sleep, relative to your health, like where are you? How does that create longevity for you in your career, professionally and personally? Uh, And it's like I, the longer I do this and the more mistakes I make, the more this becomes not only a priority for me, but something that I see as really key to people at various stages of their career, of their lives. Just make sure you prioritize yourself. The more you do that, the more time and passion and effort you will have for other people that matter in your life. Well, and the other time I'll add to that is number five, because you always have five, is make time to listen to Matt Hines on Sales Pipeline, because that should be a priority, number one there, because you will take a break, you will laugh, you will learn, you will listen, and maybe you'll learn to step back and look at things without racing through them so quickly. One can only hope. One can only hope. <laughs> well, I know we're out of time. This has been fun. We have covered your collegiate achievements. We've talked a little bit <laughs> yeah, about right. bowl spo- college football bowl sponsorships. Hopefully a little bit of lessons to help people get on the right track in 2020. But uh, we're unfortunately out of time. We'll be back next week and every week, Thursdays at 1130 Pacific, 230 Eastern. But for today, for my great producer, Paul, this is Matt Hines. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. You've been riding along in the sales pipeline right here on Funnel Radio Network for at-work listeners like you.